So, right after rebuilding my engine, you know, and putting everything back together and connecting all the hoses and the wires, uh, I actually uh, couldn't get my engine to run right. Uh, I had a misfire, uh, my engine was low on power, and I couldn't even, you know, set the ignition timing properly, because, you know, when I took aim at the crankshaft pulley with, the, with my timing light, the crankshaft pulley was all wobbly and it wouldn't st stick in place. So what I uh, had to go through is, is to troubleshoot my engine, you know, take it step by step and eliminate one by one each of the factors that could be causing, causing the problems with, with running my engine. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a basic step by step guide on how to troubleshoot your engine and to find out what's actually wrong with it and what's causing you problems. Uh, most of the stuff I'll show you today is, is, uh, is more relevant for somewhat older engines, like this 4AG in my 1987 MR2, but the basic principles of the whole thing uh, actually apply to almost all internal combustion engines. So, let's get to it. If you are actually able to fire up and start your engine, and you know if it's running, one of the easiest and first things to to look at uh, to, that will give you, you know, more clues about what's going wrong is actually your spark plugs. Okay, so here we have our spark plug. I don't know how well you can see it. But uh, the ends of your spark plug can actually tell you a lot about what's happening inside your engine. Now, if the ends are light gray or light brown, you are fine. The, the combustion is normal and the engine is running normally. Now, if, it, if they are, you know, very black or if there's a lot of deposits there, then something is definitely not right. Now, in the description of this video, check out the link and there's actually a, a big chart in that link that shows images of spark plugs, their different, different conditions and what they actually mean for, for your engine. So, since the spark, spark plugs are good, I'm going to put this one back in and we're going to keep troubleshooting. Uh, since our spark plugs uh, look okay, that means probably that we don't have any problems in this case with the fuel pressure. However, if your spark plugs don't look good, the next best thing to look at is probably your actual your fuel rail. And uh, on your fuel, uh, fuel rail, you can check, you know, whether your injectors are firing, whether you have leaking injectors, or maybe if you have bad fuel pressure. So the way to check this is one of the simplest ways to see if your injectors are firing. And those are these bad boys here. I don't know if you can see them. And this here is our fuel rail. What is below all these hoses? Now the easiest way to see if they're firing and to hear them firing right is actually one of these. I know this is a doctor's tool, it's a stethoscope, but if you put your stethoscope in your ears and put it close to your injectors, you will be able to, to hear perfectly clearly whether they are firing or not. Another easier way if you don't have on the, or don't want to get a stethoscope is actually to get a big, long, fat screwdriver and put it right on the top of your injectors and put your ear on it and actually listen to the injectors firing. In case your injectors are firing and there's no leaks, the next thing to look at is actually your, your fuel pressure. Bad fuel pressure will actually point you either towards a bad fuel pump or again maybe you have leaks in your, uh, in your, uh, in your fuel rail, in the o-rings of your injectors or something similar. So, in case you check that and everything actually seems to be fine, the next step is probably, the best next step is to move on to your intake. On the intake side of things, there's usually a lot of things going on. But uh, every uh, electronically fuel injected engine uh, needs to know two things. It needs to know how much air is coming in, and that information it gets from the airflow meter, or in the case of, of some other cars, the mass airflow sensor. And it needs to know the position of the throttle plate, which is here, and that information it gets from the throttle position sensor. Now, these two things, uh, can actually cause all sorts of uh, weird problems on your car if they aren't running right. Uh, they can actually cause uh, the, the ECU, the car computer, 
to think that you know more or less air is coming than it actually is, and you can actually think that the throttle wasn't even open. And according to that, these information, the ECU adjusts the maps and adjusts the amount of you know fuel to be injected. So obviously, if these things give the ECU wrong information, the, the engine will definitely won't run right. So the way to check out if these guys work correctly is actually to use a multimeter. Now a multimeter is a fairly simple tool to use and we have one here. Uh, this is actually an analog one. You can get a uh, digital one. It's a bit easier to use but an analog one is also just fine and will, it will give you the information you need. Now the way to check to check how these two things work is is almost the same on the, pr the basic procedure is almost the same on most cars. Your airflow meter must have some sort of connection uh, and there it is and also your throttle position sensor also has a connection. Uh, once you unplug these two connections inside our uh, uh, terminals and uh, once you get have access to your terminals you will actually use these two probes and you will measure the different resistances between different terminals. Now, these resistances, uh, of course, are different for every engine. Uh, if you want to know uh, how exactly to, you know, to measure and what are the, the data you need for a 4AG 16 valve, uh, again, in the description of the video, you can find a link. And in those links, I have put pages from the factory service manual that tell you all the values you need to, you need to see in order to know whether your airflow meter and your throttle position sensors are running right. So. Once you check those two, those two things out, the next, the next step it probably is to actually move to check out your ignition and cam timing. The next thing we're looking at is our ignition timing and our cam timing. Now, ignition timing and cam timing are two uh, very different things. Uh, your cam timing is the position of your cam relative to the position of your crankshaft and thus the position of your, of your piston. When your cam timing is off, your valves do not open and close at the appropriate times, and this causes loss of power, misfiring, and other things. Your ignition timing is actually regulated by your distributor. That is this guy here. The distributor actually regulates at which point does the spark occur in relation to the travel of the piston. If your spark doesn't occur at the right time, again, you are getting misfires, you know, improper combustion, lack of power, and so forth. Now, how do we check ignition timing and cam timing? Ignition timing in cars that have a distributor is actually checked and adjusted with a, with a timing light. And I'm going to show you one right away. This 80s sci-fi, you know, laser gun, this is actually your timing light. Uh, what your timing light does is once you hook it up properly, it actually enables you uh, to see exactly at which point does the spark occur. So if you can actually check this out and if it's good, you should move on to checking your cam timing. Now, as I told you in my case, checking ignition timing uh, proved to be impossible because my, you know, once I looked at my crankshaft pulley with my timing light, there was a lot of wobble and that was actually my first clue that something is wrong. Something is wrong in terms of, in terms of timing. Now, uh, if you want to see how to actually hook hook up and use one of these timing lights, please check out the check out this video. Check out the suggested video where I show you show you that in more detail. Now, how do you how do you check check your cam timing? Actually, checking cam timing is very simple. Uh, you're looking at your uh, cam poise, and you want to see, you want to make sure. That so once you rotate your crank, crankshaft to its top dead center position, that your cam pulleys are also in their uh, top dead center, actually TDC positions. Now, in case that all of these markings, and each, engine's, e each engine has markings for these top dead uh, center positions on both its crankshaft pulley and its uh, cam pulleys, in case all of these markings do not li line up, something is, is off in terms of your cam timing, which means your valves aren't opening and closing at correct times, and you have all the issues I have already mentioned. I have actually, once I took another look at my 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 uh, cam pulleys and, and crankshaft pulley, I have noticed that while my 
when my cam pulleys are in their top dead center positions, my crankshaft pulley isn't. And what this has actually revealed to me is that my timing belt has actually slipped, slipped the tooth, you know, skipped, skipped the tooth, and, uh, and it has actually revealed the source of my problem. Uh, why this has happened in my particular case is because of the uh, timing belt tensioner pulley, which I actually used the factory spring for tensioning, which after 30 years couldn't do its job, and it's a much better idea to actually get rid of the spring in case of an, an engine dissolved and tension the belt using the tensioner pulley uh, manually by pushing the timing belt tensioner pulley all the way to the right to achieve the correct tension on your timing belt. So that was my particular problem. However, for the sake of this demonstration, let's imagine that, you know, everything is all right with my ignition timing and my cam timing, and we can move on to the next thing that you should check out when troubleshooting your engine, and that is vacuum leaks. Okay, so all the cars and older engines like this 4AG engine often have a lot of vacuum hoses. So there's some of them here, there's some of them around, you know, the EGR, there's some of them down here, and there's a whole bunch of them underneath the intake manifold. Now, uh, vacuum hoses, when they become old, they become brittle, you know, they crack, and this can cause a bunch of vacuum leaks. So it's often the case that, you know, 30-year-old, 25-year-old cars, you know, have not one, but, you know, several vacuum leaks. And vacuum leaks can also occur not just around the hoses, but also around the uh, intake manifold gaskets, you know, the throttle body gaskets, and all these other places. Because there are so many, you know, potential places for a vacuum leak, looking for vacuum leaks can actually be a, be a pretty tedious, you know, and very boring job. So the, the easiest and the fastest way to actually find vacuum leaks is by using, you know, throttle body cleaner spray or, you know, starter fluid spray. Now, uh, people may argue that this is unsafe and that is, that is partly true because both of these liquids are actually combustible and they can, you know, set your engine on fire if not done right. So when checking for vacuum leaks using, using these two, these two, any of these two liquids, it's very important to be extra safe and extra cautious. And I definitely advise, you know, keeping, keeping a, a flame retardant sub substance or a fire extinguisher or anything else to, you know, to stop a fire in case that it happens. The most common way, you know, that a fire can happen when doing, when looking for vacuum leaks using starter fluid is uh, from your uh, plug wires. If you have old plug wires, you know, whose spark, you know, is happening all around them or, you know, isn't actually direct to the spark plugs, which can happen when these things crack, Th this spark can ignite the, you know, the spray, the fluid, and, you know, can set your engine on fire. So as I said, keep, an, keep a working fire extinguisher handy. Now, the way to actually look for these vacuum leaks is, is very simple. You will start your engine, you will run your engine, and while the engine is running, spray very small amounts of the spray at all the potential vacuum leak spots. Now, how you will know that you have a vacuum leak is that you will notice a change in your RPM. The RPMs, you know, will make a very noticeable change and your engine will change its sound because the uh, starter fluid has actually entered through the vacuum leak, you know, into the intake manifold and into your combustion chambers. And that changes the engine sound and will actually help you narrow down your, your vacuum leak spot and, you know, replace the offending hose or gasket. As you can see, this has been a very simple and brief tutorial on how to troubleshoot, you know, some of your basic engine problems. Of course, you know, engines are very complex pieces of machinery and problems that they can have are definitely not limited to what I have shown you in this quick guide. However, these are some of the most common ones and the easiest to diagnose and solve by yourself. In case your engine isn't starting, I'll definitely start by looking if there is a spark, if their spark is happening. I will look at your ignition, I will look at the ignition coil, and of course, obviously, at the battery and at the starter. So, this has been a very simple guide. I hope, you know, somebody finds it helpful, and, you know, it helps, helps people solve some of the issues that may be very annoying and, you know, preventing you from enjoying your engine. So, that's it. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe.